Uh, my name is Clay Parker. I work for Tremble Navigation. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you about today is how we migrated the SketchUp 3D warehouse from Google into uh, AWS. Talk about the selection uh, criteria, where what we went through to get to make the decision on AWS. It was a fairly easy decision, but it was at least a decision. Um, we evaluated a couple other providers and went from there. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself first. I've been with Tremble Navigation almost eight years now. Uh, I've done a little bit of everything in the IT side, uh, networking, system engineering manager. Uh, when we started getting into cloud three years ago, uh, I was the natural guy to start the cloud team. Uh, and I've been working with uh, AWS Cloud almost exclusively for a little over three years. Talk a little bit about Tremble Navigation. Um, Tremble Navigation is a world leader in GPS type technologies. Uh, we started out in 1978 in California, literally building survey GPS devices. Um, the transition is we're pretty much in every vertical that you can think about today. Uh, we're in ag, agriculture, construction, uh, just about everything you can imagine. I currently work for the group, a uh, buildings group, uh, where we do a lot of 3D modeling, do a lot of things to assist design, build, operate, and have uh, help contractors build buildings through virtualization, model 3D uh, images. Uh, one of the things that we, this particular group, decided that you know, we needed some help with 3D modeling, so at that point in time, we went out and acquired SketchUp. Um, as part of that agreement, one of the requirements was that we move SketchUp off of, the three, off of Google hardware into some other pro uh, provider. Um, we went through that process. You know, one of the biggest challenges in this whole deal was moving big data. We're talking about, originally the warehouse consisted of uh, 2.5 million objects that were geographically uh, dispersed all over the world in Google's infrastructure. Uh, we had to figure out how to move it to another cloud provider. And one of the things that we like to do is run our applications from a single location, so not looking at the ability to run it in a single region, not in multiple regions. Um, Lock-in was a big concern for us because anytime you start out with a new application and put it on any kind of new infrastructure, you're always worried that it's not going to work properly. And if you code it to specifically where it only works in a single cloud provider, you're, you're at risk that if it doesn't perform properly or doesn't work well, that there's a whole bunch of code that has to be written to migrate it to something else. Uh, we wanted to make sure that didn't happen. Um, we, were, we had a very specific deadline that we had to meet, uh, and we were looking at service providers, cloud providers that would give us the ability to meet that timeline and be able to do things in a rapid manner, uh, be very agile to do that. Um, cost is always important and not just the cost of the move. That was one of the things that we were very concerned about was how much work and engineering would it take to, call, to move this application and have it work in another cloud someplace. And we were looking at long-term strategy for cost reduction. We're, when we selected a cloud provider, we did so based on could we have a long-term cost reduction model? You know, what features were available on these providers that gave us the ability to, re to reduce our cost over time rather than continue to have costs grow and go up. So technical considerations, what do we need to support? You know, we needed a very robust set of application services that had the capability to be you know, adaptable and tuned to where we needed that to happen. You know, in our selection process, we, we talked about the fact that I wanted to have, we wanted to have this in a specific one region. To do that, we had to be able to use 
a good CDN product that gave us the ability to do that. Um, low cost storage, you know, how could, because we're talking about a large number of models and the fact that those models might, are going to grow over time, we need to, in our cost model, we need to make sure that whatever cloud provider we selected that we would be able to get low cost on-demand storage. You know, and throughput, for in a Netflix world, this is a fairly small application. The throughput would be not that big a deal. However, for Tremble, this was a very, very large application for us. It was something that we'd, we'd not had to deal with before at this level and at this scale with this much throughput. So we wanted to be very careful and make sure that we had enough throughput in whatever provider we selected. We also, Trimble's very conservative about the ability to have high availability for their, all their applications, especially, especially production applications, and also have a geodispersed uh, disaster recovery site. One of the things that we were trying to do was make sure that we could put this in one location, but because Google was running this very in very diverse locations all over the world, there was always the possibility that we would have to do that. Uh, when we started talking about a lar very large worldwide footprint, your list of service providers, cloud providers, goes down very, very quickly. So why didn't we select AWS? So we'd already had background working with AWS with most of the services that they had. Uh, we're very familiar with EC2. We're very familiar with the capabilities that we could, how to run on it and what it was capable of giving us. But we just thought we knew quite a bit. We found out through this that we learned a whole lot about how to take better advantage of you know, EC2. We'd already, the, prior to the move, when the download for the client was moved, it was set up in Amazon CloudFront already, so we had some experience. That was done by a partner, uh, the implementation. So when you go to download the SketchUp client, you're actually going through CloudFront. We were looking for a robust set of DNS services, so Route 53 provided us that. It's also getting better and better every day. Some of the newer announcements are, have been very helpful for us. Um, we had some experience with S3 and we thought S3 was gonna support us very well, so uh, we're very happy with using S3. We also knew that applications like Netflix were running, so there was no question about AWS being able to provide us with the throughput that we needed. Uh, a lot of our guys had been trained on reference architectures and how to properly design and architect applications for AWS, both on the infrastructure side and the application side, so we were comfortable with that. I'll tell you a little bit about what is, what is the application that we're talking about. So TCC, Trimble Connected Community, was already running in AWS infrastructure. It was close enough for us to be able to add the 3DW warehouse application on top of that and co-habitat with that. Uh, they were very close. Um, so the warehouse was built on top of uh, TCC, Terminal Connected Community. Uh, the 3D warehouse has uh, 10 million objects. So I told you a while ago that we we're moving 2.5 million and we ended up with 10. And I'll explain to you how that number comes up and how significant it is. Um, our current load balancers at peak times are running between 1,800 and uh, 3,200 hits per minute. Totally we have, between the two applications, we have uh, 15 million objects in storage. This is, re this shouldn't look any strange to anyone. The only difference is, is you know, we're following AWS's best practices on how to build for HA. We're running in a single VPC. We're using uh, Route 53 for DNS. We have a CloudFront implementation on the front end uh, that's pointed at an external 3DW load balancer. 
Uh, there's, there's a separate set of buckets for TCC content and 3DW content. Internally, we're running a couple of uh, load balancers, one for uh, solar and one for the 3DW traffic. Uh, what you see at the top on the outside is HA proxy, which is what we're using to load balance the TCC uh, application, and I'll explain why that and not ELB here in just a few minutes. We're also running uh, My uh, MySQL, uh, Master and Slave currently with a small pilot lighted uh, DR in Nova. This, is all, this all resides in uh, Oregon. Uh, I know that you see two M's. The, con the reason for that is, is this is proposed. We're, we're, we're trying to move forward to, well, we were looking at Percona SQL, but Aurora has, we're very excited about Aurora and the possibility of being able to use Aurora rather than a, a SQL cluster. So I'll talk a little bit about what specifically is in the 3DW warehouse. Uh, we're currently running uh, two instances, one in uh, availability zone 2A and one in 2C. Um, one instance can handle the full load, uh, so that way if we lose one of the availability zones, we can stay up and, and carry the load. And there are also, when I talk a little bit more, I'll explain to you why it's also more, uh, very important in our process to have two that are, that are capable of carrying the full, or correction, one that is capable of carrying the full load. Um, we're currently using RIs to back those uh, for cost savings. How we do that is a little interesting, and like I said, I'll talk you through that process here in just a few seconds. Uh, solar servers, um, for those of you that are not familiar with what solar is, it's a search engine. It gives you the ability to offload your, your search workload off of your database and do it uh, off of your precious, uh, your precious database resources and actually speeds up searches. We're also following the same model. One of the things that we're doing that is unique is we're, we're very heavily in the spot market for a lot of different things, not just back-end back, -end batch processing. So render servers is one of the areas where we're really taking advantage of the spot market as well as other places. But this, so currently we use an auto-scaling group to, re, to render an object. So as a SketchUp user, you can upload a model, a 3D model, when you put that in the model in the, sorry in the data warehouse that has to be rendered so when you go to the sketchup site you will see that there's all there are thumbnails that you're looking at so as you start to drill down you see different views of thumbnails and that's where we're using the render process currently today but the render process those 2.5 million objects that were moved, models that were moved from Google to SketchUp, that's exactly how they were moved. And one of the key points is, not only did we have to move those objects, we had to re-render them in a new format and in a different view. Um, today, the auto scaling group ha is set to a maximum of 300. Um, so we can run up to 300 spot instances to do that. Today we run one small uh, on-demand instance backed by an RI to take care of the day-to-day -day normal piece without a heavy load. We already talked a little bit about SQL. We're running a MySQL, Percona MySQL cluster, or correction, we're running a Percona MySQL master and slave. We have a master in uh, availability zone 2A. In 2C, we have a slave. We also have a slave uh, in US East for DR. And one of the things I'll highlight about being the flexibility of EC2 is today we've made the decision that we're going to move away from our current C3 8 extra large database instance types to the R3 class. Um, 
what we're doing today is we've already stood up most of those instances and they are running. We have our eyes purchased to back them and we're already sinking those. And on the day that it comes time to, tr to transition to those, we'll be able to just stop, it, stop the traffic at the front end and then cut over to the new master. Just promote what is a slave today running right alongside the current master in the same AZ and make it the master. And it, in very short order, we've, con we've changed our uh, instance type with very little downtime. CloudFront, we're currently running a worldwide CloudFront. We're using every endpoint. Uh, some very interesting data that we found out that Google couldn't even tell us. Uh, we expected that U.S. and Europe was going to be a heavy load. We had no idea that San Paulo was going to be a very heavy workload, and it, it is. And that's one of the things that we can see from CloudFront reporting where the majority of our users are coming from and how that is working. Um, we're using an external load balancer for the 3DW warehouse. Uh, TCC uses HA proxy, and I told you I'd explain that. We have a very, very heavy FTP load, and we're having to use uh, HA proxy to support that load rather than elastic load balancing. Um, we'll continue to look at the possibility of moving off of HA proxy onto elastic load balancing, but right now we're happy with what we have. Um, internal, we're running a application ELB and a solar ELB. Route 53, we're migrating everything. Between the, the announcements of, so we can now move all the stuff that we run in GoDaddy or any other registration right into Route 53. We can, you know, we currently have eight hosted zones. We're being very successful using uh, Route 53 for our DNS service. We also have our own dynamic DNS servers as instances. Last week, I believe it was last week, they announced the fact that they're now supporting dynamic DNS in Route 53. So that gives us an option. We may, I mean, we have to evaluate it, test it, and make sure it works the way we expect it to, but we believe that we'll be able to migrate off those instances and put that in Route 53. Will it just save us more money in EC2 cost? You just have to do a, a cost comparison to see which one is more cost friendly, whether to continue to do it the way that we're doing it and make sure that it's at the same price and we get the same feature set. So TCC has started out running on EBS volumes and we're storing all the data in EBS volumes. The plan when we, that we chose to migrate 3DW and follow that same model initially, and then once we had everything migrated over, we started moving everything from EBS volumes into S3 storage. That gave us the ability to greatly reduce cost for EBS, uh, greatly reduce the amount of provision IOPS that we had to use to support those instances. Um, and that's, you know, one of the things that we like about it is when we, an object is uploaded, rendered, and put into S3 storage, it's in real time sent to our DR site on the East Coast so that if we have a DR incident, we don't have to worry about all of, that there's a differential between the, the S3 buckets. And we don't have to, do, one of the key important things there is we don't have to manage that. It's happens with the S3, you know, we configure it in S3 and it just runs. We're not having to worry about, are we moving those models in any other way? We're also taking advantage of the fact that older data can be archived in the glacier. So I'll talk about the live production cutover. This is where it gets interesting. Um, 
one of the key points here is this is brand new code. It had never been run any place else. We really had no idea of how well it was going to perform during the cutover. And there was some, and it's, Google just couldn't give us good data about how heavy the load was going to be and what we we're going to see. So we're, you know, it was very interesting. You know, we started out with the assumption that it was going to be uh, 4,000 hits per second, which was pretty close. We did it. The plan was to do it in four stages with no downtime. Um, as we were cutting over, we found out by stage two that we had some serious issues. Um, the app completely performed differently than we expected, which caused the CPU loads on the application servers to go way up. So we're in a quandary. Um, we knew we had to do something. We also had the same problem with the database, the CPU load on the database ser servers, but it happened later in the cutover. So it was very, you know, very tense few moments. Um, so we sat, to, we sat down, thought about what is it that we can do? What do we do? What are our options? Do we stop this, leave it in its current state, half cut over? Do we have to roll it completely back? What are our options? This is where AWS saved us. We were able to, because we're running two equal size application servers, we were able to, lo to take one of those out of the load balancer, stop it, resize it, put it back in the load balancer. We did the same thing with the second one. That's when it got interesting. Once we did that, we transferred the load from the application servers to the database server. So now we're in, we have a problem. We're no longer going to be able to do a, you know, a no downtime cutover. So we spent a little time making sure that we were selecting the correct uh, database instance size, and we did the same thing. We stopped the database server, resized it, and it came back up. It ha actually happened in less than four minutes, somewhere between three and four minutes. We were back up and we were able to move forward. You know, we're also watching very closely in the, on what was happening, how to do certain things, and we were able to tailor the uh, application and the workload so that we could start to reduce the size of the application servers. So then, then we were able to, to go backwards and reduce the size of the application instances down one, correction down, correct, one size for the uh, application servers and two sizes for the database server. Um, in the old days, we'd have been done. We'd have been stuck. If you think about and not only would we have been stuck once, we'd have been stuck twice. Because had we been doing this on physical hardware and we not had enough resources, we would have had to add, add new resources twice. And we would have had to order and add more resources. So we would have been stuck. It, you know, it just, you know, the, the flexibility of AWS made this move a success. And w what I'm going to talk about is why is that? So the instance flexibility I've already touched on a little bit, but not just in the cutover is that important. Um, it's infrastructure on demand. So there's been, you know, when we release code, sometimes a bug slips through. And when you do that, you have unintended consequences. We've seen the CPU load on both the application and the solar servers go up. Um, so you have, you can look at all kinds of different options on how you can can remedy that for the short term. So what we do is we pull one instance, whether it be an application server or a solar server out of the load balancer, we increase the size of it, put it back in the load balancer and do the other. By doing that, it gives the development guys, which part of them are sitting right here in the front row, <laughs> or close to the front row, actually now they can go back and instead of trying to thrash and get a hot fix in place, they can focus on what they need to do with that hot fix. They have headroom where we're not, we're not having, you know, the system or the application be impacted. They, so they can go back, take their time, go through the regular process, diagnose the problem, write a hot fix, and code review that hot fix, peer review that hot fix, and then put it through the whole 
deployment process so that you're, you have a huge amount of confidence that that hot fix is going to not only solve your problem, but it's not going to create another problem because you thrashed in such a hurry to put it in place. It's really a completely different way to look at infrastructure and how to do these kinds of things without impact. And, not a, and when we talk about flexibility, so, there have been other occasions where rather than do that model, we've created another set of instances. I think the largest number we've run of application servers has been as, numbers has been as high as six. So you have a whole bunch of different ways to operate and look at the flexibility of what is a better way to get myself out of this or to do different things. And you can test and do all kinds of things. That's, that's the kind of flexibility that Amazon EC2 gives you. you know. Um, it, it's just been amazing in the fact that we can do that. Um, and when we start talking about cost, I'll go into that a little deeper about what, how we've looked at cost. Same thing with Amazon S3. By moving everything off of EBS storage, we've greatly reduced our storage cost. You know, we have a bunch of flexibility on how we do things in S3, plus we have the ability to do backups between regions native in S3. So I talked, I threw out some numbers earlier about CloudFront and EOB load. So we talked about we have 4,000 hits per second on the front end, and our, and our external EOB is seeing between 1,800 and 3,200 hits per minute. So that tells you how effective CloudFront has been for our application. This is the key point that allowed us to be able to, to run CloudFront across the world and put our application in a single region and have no worry that whatever the, the load grows to, that we'll be able to support that because we know we have headroom in ELB to be able to support that. So, I mean, it, it's just amazing that how much that's made the application work better and less complexity of not having to run in multiple regions and being able to run in a single region. So three years ago when I first started to work with AWS, they were just beginning to figure out how to work with enterprises. They really didn't have a good strategy for working with enterprises. What we've found over the past three years at these guys have really engaged with enterprises, especially us, and been very rapid to change and provide the support and additional things, features that we needed um, to do that. And one of the things that um, I want to talk about is we're currently, with CloudFront, is we're moving to another feature. So I have, in the past, we've used Akamai, which would have probably worked in this situation. But what you don't get with an external product like Akamai is the interaction with other services like Elastic Beanstalk. We just started to move to Elastic Beanstalk for certain applications, and that has really made a difference in you know, how easy it is to integrate those types of tools. Um, and I talk about Route 53 again, it's lowered our cost and it's given us one place to manage DNS. Once we get everything migrated into Route 53, we'll be able to take care of that. Now I want to talk, I really want to talk about cost reductions and not just the standard things that you would look at and understand. What we're really doing is using a cost reduction methodology. So one of the things that most people think about is you just go out and, find, and you pick an instant size and you buy an RI to support that. What we've done is we've baselined specifically what we're using on that instant size and we've, re we've been able to reduce the instant size as we go, benchmark it, run it through the test, and then go out and buy uh, the reserved instance to support it. We're also, you know, really uh, aggressive in the spot market. You know, 
we're doing things with the spot with spot instances because you know they tell you that inc the instances will just stop well they do sometimes go away but we have not experienced that we wholesale lose spot instances now some of that is careful selection of what spot market you get into if you're into one of the spot markets where it's heavily utilized you can see some cost increases but i'll give you an example of cost savings when we did the the migration and re-render of the servers we were purchasing spot instances at less than approximately half a cent an hour you know we were able to render what we thought would originally the math said it would take months and months maybe a year on some type of physical hardware we were able to do it in about a week so I mean that's a huge cost savings by being able to be in the spot market to do it so I'll give you some I'm not going to give you actual numbers, but I'll give you a percentile. At this point, we've reduced our cost from go live production 40%, not just in production, across all of our dev and test accounts, and as well as production by using a very uh, creative utilization of RIs and making sure that we're not using resources that we don't need and careful use of spot markets. We're, we're using spot instances to do development on today, development and test on. So that's really a huge cost savings. And I looked at the numbers today and it appears that in fourth quarter for the months of November and December, we will most likely have reduced our costs somewhere between 10 and 20 more, 20, 10 and 20% more, and we continue to go that route. And when you can have the conversation with your finance guys that you're lowering cost rather than costs are just going way up, you know, lots of times cloud infrastructure has a reputation of being very expensive because you can't control, you know, your dev costs. That's where your dev costs are. It appears this month we will have reduced our dev the cost of our development account considerably. Maybe not, you know, maybe not 50%, but very close. So one of the other things I want to talk about AWS that's made our life so much easier is the software as a service tools that are out there. Uh, monitoring services, logging services, all kinds of different tools that you can just subscribe to. You no longer have to go out and purchase an enterprise agreement, buy, all the, buy you know, a long-term site and commit yourself to a long-term agreement and spend lots of money. Currently, we're using Datadog. Now I'll go three slides. Oh, he left. Yeah. This will be interesting. It says that the, lower, the laptop's about to die. <laughs> Hey, so it says this laptop's gonna, buy, gonna die and I have less than 1% battery life on it. So monitoring, we're using Datadog. So, one of the, so as I mentioned about the fact, we're entered in an agreement with Datadog where we're paying them by the month. If something happens, something comes out better next month, we can move off of Datadog and go to that. If Stackdriver comes up with a feature set that makes Datadog better, we can do that. Um, the reason why we're using selected Datadog at this point is because their dashboarding capability is amazing. If I have a developer that, I w that needs to look at a specific API or a specific feature, I can create a custom dashboard 
email that, that developer a link. I don't have to create him a user. I don't have to do anything. I just send him the link and he sees only what I need him to see. So there's no confusion. He can see specifically what he needs to see. Also, I can tailor a dashboard for an operations guy. I can tailor a dashboard for you know, management when they're just looking at specific things, that kind of stuff. All right, thank you. Um, it has excellent CloudWatch integration, and also we have a complete, day, uh, complete dashboard that's nothing but where we're monitoring our APIs. Uh, you know, it's an excellent tool. I'm not trying to sell you Datadog, but what I'm doing is give you an example of that these tools are out there, and it's stuff that you, could, that you wouldn't be able to use before. What we really like is the integration between PagerDuty and Datadog. Um, and there's, we found some things in Datadog that are correction PagerDuty that we just did not understand were going to be there. We were looking for, you know, schedule, scheduling, escalation, but the ability to do, you know, analytics and trending on, you know, what you're seeing and why you're seeing them. PagerDuty just gives you an amazing, amazing interface to do that. But one of the other things that it does is in its escalation policy, you can literally set up groups to where you no longer just escalate to application support. If there's a specific application, like we have a, a specific person who is an expert on solar, so we wouldn't escalate to someone else, we would specifically escalate to that person, and you can do that Anyone can do that based on configuration in PagerDuty. Oh, it's those kinds of things have been amazing. Oh, we're currently using Logly. We don't know if that's going to stick or not because there's plenty of other things out there and we're starting to evaluate other things. But right now, uh, Logly is doing what we need it to do. And it really solves the problem of, you know, your traditional problem of how do I give the developer access to the logs and not give them access to my instances, my servers, you know, and you can do that in Logly. It's an excellent tool to, you know, run reports on what, you, what you're seeing for your problems and also, you know, you can filter logs and find what you're looking for. So I want to spend some some time on this slide. What you're looking at is a server guard screen capture to the 28th of, Nova, of September. We put a brand new application in an unknown service, and this is what we've been able to do. And the slide says, I had to submit my slides, but since we've submitted the slides on bullet number two where it says we're currently doing monthly releases and we're moving towards two-week releases, we're now doing two releases every two weeks. As if Aurora works out like we think, we may be able to get to the point of having no downtime when we do our releases, because today the only reason why we have downtime is because we have to make a database change that requires you know, that we stop the database. Other than that, so yesterday we had a meeting on Tuesday where we talked specifically about that. So far in fourth quarter, we have had no in scheduled downtime, zero scheduled downtime. Obviously, because we're currently planning to move from the current database instance size, we're going to get some this month, but, or either this month or next month. It looks like it'll be the first part of next month. But we've been able to go the whole quarter without any scheduled downtime. And we've been doing releases. It's not that we haven't been doing releases. We have done those releases, but we just had zero downtime. You know, the features are just amazing that we've been able to take it take advantage of. You know, I'll review the fact that you know we started out with brand new code, 
We started out with a brand new environment and a whole mess of unknowns. And we've been extremely successful to take it to market. A lot of that has to do with the team that's done it, but it's also their ability to understand what features are available in AWS and to take advantage of those and use them to their advantage to make sure that we got the best out of the, the cloud service provider. So, and you know, we're very, very happy with where we are today. I think it's only gonna get better. And with that, that's all I have. I'd be happy to take any questions. Well, it depends on the workload. Can be hours. So, if we're so, I'll give you an example. If we're talking about a development spot instance, by default, when it comes up, it has a life of 55 minutes. <laughs> but it can be extended to whatever, you know. The intent is to, for a developer to use that spot instance, their shift, and then it goes away. We don't have to worry about those guys shutting them off, they just go away. But we've not been, as far as seeing a spot instance failure, early on when we were learning how to use large groups of spot instances, there were some limits that we had to deal with uh, as far as what you can bid for on the spot market, there's a limit because you know, there, people are doing some crazy things in the spot market, but we, we don't normally see a spot instance just disappear. Yes, sir. So to be honest with you, it would, it would vary. Bill, do you have any idea what the total data size was? So, Correct. Yes. So we tested RDS initially. We need to go back and look at it. Well, we may not ever go back and look at it now that Aurora is available, but we had performance issues with RDS initially. Right. Right. What we're using Solar is Solar pulls a complete copy of the database and, you, and, and uses it to do searches to find objects and offloads the workload from the database server and it's all. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm not sure whether it's an imp. And it, I'm sure it has to reside in memory. Yes, sir. No, that's compared to what we're where we started for cost reductions. So that we didn't have that information because Google, it was an internal application. They didn't share that cost with us, so we have no idea what it cost Google to run it the way they ran it.
Any other questions? All right, thank you. I appreciate your time.